We pray for our earth, place of nature and abundance, place of treasure and joy, place of shelter and delight, and yet we injure it. Turn us, God, from destroying the place that gives us life. Turn each of us, citizens, leaders, all towards everything that will help us thrive safely here together. This is our prayer. We make our prayer in the name of love. Welcome to Greenbelt, wherever you are. My name is Padraig and I've loved Greenbelt since my first one in 2004. Today, some of us are camping, others are at home, some are in cars or in bed or in work or in transit. Some people are together and others are alone. This is the second year that we haven't been able to have a festival. And I know for me, the heart hurts for not being at that sacrament of gathering that is Greenbelt. I look forward to when we can be together. We're in such debt to all those who've worked hard to keep us healthy and supplied with vegetables and education and transport and the hundreds of ways in which generous people, you, have done so much, often under stress over this time of COVID. We can't have gatherings in our tents or campsites or tea tents or big top at Greenbelt, but we thought we'd offer you this, a little patchwork of insights and prayers and interviews of voices of goodness that can deepen our hope to keep looking for and doing the job of paradise. That's our theme for this year's Greenbelt Sunday podcast, The Job of Paradise, taking its title from a poem from the brilliant poet Roger Robinson. I got to talk to Roger about his poem, but first, here he is reading it. The Job of Paradise It is the job of paradise to comfort those who have been left behind, to think that all those loved and lost would live on there like tiny gods. It is the job of mumble prayers to help you calm your hurts and fears. It is the job of the long black hearse to show we head to death from birth. It is the job of the clean, neat grave to remind us how to live our days. If only I could live my days till death suffice and make earth feel like paradise. I, I'm not a, a traditional Christian in terms of I don't go to church anymore and I don't I don't do all the kind of standard things, but I'm very interested in prayer and how it invigorates me and 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 I think what it does you know the the idea of voiced hope for me is incredibly interesting you know and and I think the book began to speak for other people I'm not sure but what from what people have told me like during the lockdown and during the viruses and you know um George Floyd I didn't know how many other things were coming and I think the book began to take on increased importance to people because it provided something that, you know, if you strayed away from religion, you can use this and not feel, you know, and not have the dogma of religion with it, you know. You're open hearted in the book and in this poem about the realities of prejudice and the realities of economic injustice. And you're open hearted about comfort, too. You bring mm -hmm. those things together. Is that mm -hmm. a deliberate choice or is it just something you needed to do to bring this kind of outrage at the state of things together with a voice of comfort? I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I definitely didn't start off. It was not a writerly thing I was trying to do. So it's, it was probably um, it ended up like that. I always had this thing that if you were going to spew something, you so like if you're going to criticize someone, you always have to be able to um, praise something. So probably somewhere within me, it's just like, okay, it can't just be all venom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, looking back and, um, and also too, you know, it may be that the idea of, you know, uh, how prayer or voicing your hope in a time of trauma can work, it had to have some sense of, does it work? You know, it's like, it, like is there an answer, you know? Um, so that's probably why it came out like that. So. And does it work? You know, you're, the question for you is about, you know, comfort in the face of, of, envir or of economic injustice and trauma. Mm. Does it work? Yeah, it does work. But I do believe it does work in terms of um, me personally, trying to calm triggers 
you know, and in and then you you after common triggers, you can make action, mm-hmm. and uh, and trying to count, you know, I I think prayer or voicing hope or you know if you could call it meditation whatever it is the technology that you call it it helps slow down the world enough for you to say okay what action can i make you know what can i actually do and i think to some extent that's the technology of it that's the thing that's constantly replicable you know Mm -hmm. to, to bring you down create focus think that this can happen and better can come but to make action i have this idea that you know uh, of of creative citizenship that you know we, with your creativity you're responsible for trying to build a better world or at least the world you want even if it's not better but use your creativity to kind of wield responsibility as opposed to being an activist who's out there on the trenches every day but a creative citizen like using creativity to to kind of create this world that you want and use it to apply things and 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 um you know destroy all outdated notions of who is a citizen and what they should deserve and how this world should be, you know? Yeah. Mm. To carry a light. Yeah. Grenfell is a huge presence in the earlier part of the book. And I I kind of feel like the fact that those Grenfell poems are at the start, I feel Mm. like so many of the poems, including this one, The Job of Paradise, continue to be an echo, a prayer, a lament for Grenfell Mm. and everything that contributed to that injustice. For sure. And, and injustice isn't going. Nobody's come. Nobody's been charged. Nobody's taken any responsibility for it. And and every year it comes. It's like okay, nobody's been charged for this. And it's a very strong sign about how the black and brown community are treated and what's important and what's unimportant. And there are other towers that still have the same cladding. It's like, are you kidding me? Like seriously, you know? And so, so you know, it's an ongoing thing, you know. And people are starting to pull out. So the weird thing that's happening is that people start to pull out my poems every year, remembering Grenfell that nothing has happened. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like man, these things may function well for me personally in terms of book sales, but that's this is not what I wanted. Like, I I don't want a book more than a solution. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, yeah. Like, yeah. You, you want Grenfell to be a piece of history rather than an ongoing yeah, uh, and it, reality. I, I was, I want some people want resolution for it. You know what I'm saying? Like people can't get closure. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, look how many victims of people not rehoused properly, people being forgotten about. And like, how are they supposed to get closure? You know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those, one of those weird things, you know, like people just hope it dies down, but it's never going to die down. Because people are not going to forget. Yeah. Um, Yeah. um, And then, and it just started to come out like that. Like it really started to make its own form, you know, from, from the time you have the kind of repetition of it is the job, you know? And then, mm-hmm. yeah. So you had the question and, and a kind of answer to some extent. Uh, yeah. But the utility, like, I think I'm, I think the book is really interested in the utility of rituals, like in utility of prayer, the utility of, of the, uh, the utility and poetics of the rituals that we have that we can use. So it could kind of, so, you know, I would love that the book is a guidebook for people who are suffering trauma and they think, well, perhaps I might do this. You know, I always talk with one of my best friends who is a the most non-religious person you could ever think about, you know? And he had a child. He said he never had children. He had a child. And his child um, was very, very ill. And, of course, my child was very, very ill. And he rang me up and he said, Yo, can you say a prayer for my child? And I was like, I was so moved by that. You know what I'm saying? So, I, like, I wrote, I literally wrote a prayer for him and for my child in memory, you know? And, and, and it's actually in the book, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like... um. But it's just the whole idea. Somebody asked me the other day uh, to uh, write a poem for his uncle's funeral, who is really close to. I was like, wow. Like, I felt so honored to do that. I was like, look, just give me all the information that you can. I know this is a troubled time. Give me all the information that you can. And I was like, you know, I just want to do this right. Sent it to him early. Just say, okay, what's wrong here? What's right? Because I have to go by intuition a little bit. He said, most of it's right, except for this part. I was like, okay, I'll fix that. Anything else you want to add in quickly? And then he told it to me, and he was so happy. Like, he called me up, like, literally in tears. He said, I'm laughing, I'm crying. This is the best thing your boy called it. Utility. This is important. Poetry is important in people's lives, you know? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm, you know, if you was to ask me, I'm super happy I won a prize. I'm super happy this book is selling. But what's more important to me is the utility of the book. 
how is this serving? Who, who does this serve? You know, I, and I, I sometimes I read books and they're not meant to me and they're not meant to serve me, but I hope they're serving somebody. And when I work with young writers, I was like, yo, who are you serving with this gift you have? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you have a gift. Who are you serving with it? Because you can't be serving yourself. That's not what say. That's not what you got the gift for. Mm-hmm. And we all are here to serve, and we all have gifts. So we have to wonder who are we serving with the gifts we have in the best way we can. In the great poem of creation, we read that we are made in your image, God of all living things and beings, jugglers and jabberwocky, bees and butterflies. Actors, ants and acrobats, poets, painters and pine martins, musicians, mine artists and marsh wiggles, wrens and other writers. In a year that's been difficult for artists, we pray for all who create. May they hear their creative calling even deeper. May they find audience and income and appreciation. We give thanks to and for them. They remind us of what it is to be alive. God of all art, art of all God, this is our prayer. We make our prayers in the name of art.
One of the long-standing partners of Greenbelt is Christian Aid, who do extraordinary work in supporting partners in 29 countries, creating a world where people can live a full life free from poverty. Here's Chinny MacDonald, trustee of Greenbelt and head of engagement for Christian Aid, in conversation with James Wani, who's the country director of Christian Aid in South Sudan. James, lovely to talk to you. Tell us where you are in the world. Uh, I'm currently in Juba, South Sudan. And what is it that you do? Uh, I work for charity aid called Christian Aid. And um, in South Sudan, um, we are supporting uh, humanitarian work. Uh, as you know, South Sudan uh, is ranked among the worst humanitarian countries uh, globally. And this has been mainly due to uh, years of conflict uh, that has been compounded by uh, lately by COVID-19. Uh, as well, outbreak of Ebola and, and other shocks that the country has experienced, including economic shocks as a result of, uh, uh years of conflict. Uh, so the, 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 it has pushed significant population, uh, into acute vulnerability, including a context now we are facing risk of hunger countrywide. So in all of that, um, and in the role that you do, I can't imagine what it must be like to come across those kinds of stories um, every day. Are there any particular stories um, that you think about, um, that you think about when you wake up or when you go to sleep, that really demonstrate the dire situation among the communities in South Sudan at the moment? Every day I think about how I can be the voice of, of that uh, pregnant mother, of that uh, uh, orphan uh, or, or widow who has lost uh, his husband to, uh, to the conflict. And that through uh, the platform that I access, through the opportunities that I have to engage, that I could be the difference that they need. And also through the opportunity that I have to engage with the government, that I can influence some of the policies that continues to undermine their potential, Uh, especially for a young country with such a a huge potential and future to be part of uh, of the global uh, community. Uh, One of the things that's so devastating, I guess, um, about the UK aid cuts and the impact on communities around the world, including in South Sudan, is is the timing of it, isn't it? It's um, it's a time when globally we're all facing a pandemic, we're all in need, um, and countries, um, in poorer countries around the world, need us more now because of the dire situation that they're in, but because of COVID and all that it's done um, to worsen the situations of conflict and uh, climate uh, change and catastrophe and debt that these countries are already in. So it feels like the worst of times. And um, I guess what would your thoughts be on that? And um, I guess where, where do you find hope to continue on despite the, the disappointment? Well, uh, we we are still very hopeful, uh, even though the government has renegated on its commitment and cut on AIDS when it's most needed, especially for the people of South Sudan. Uh, we believe that individual uh, citizens uh, within the UK can make the difference. 
uh, they can still take a stand against the government and commit to closing that gap uh, so that we can continue this very critical uh, work that uh, the people of South Sudan uh, hold as the only hope uh, to change the status quo so that they can elect leaders uh, of their choice for the first time uh, after independence that they can hold to account so some kind of governance can be established a democratic process can uh, can 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 take shape so that is the hope and that is um, the daunting task that the church uh, despite uh, uh, the setback uh, has remained focused on through uh, the support of, uh, of Christian aid. So we are very hopeful the UK public can still help us uh, uh, achieve uh, what every single South Sudan is, uh, is, uh, is dreaming. On a planet of beauty, we make war. There are wars we know about, and wars we haven't heard about yet. Wars that are fought by day or night, in cities or deserts, on borders and internally. We pray for all devastated by war, civic unrest, strife, exploitation and greed. We pray for all at risk of losing their lives today and tomorrow and the day after. Give energy and insight to peace negotiators. God of language, bring war makers trade to an end. Support all seeking safety across another border. Bless all peacemakers making peace where there is none. This is our prayer. We make our prayer in the name of peace. Another partner of Greenbelt is Trussell Trust, who support a nationwide network of food banks, but importantly, work in policy and practice to create a UK with no need for food banks. A few weeks ago, I spoke with Jonathan Lees, who's the founder and managing director of Epsom and Ewell Food Bank. We started back in 2012 because we had a number of people come to us that we knew were struggling with food and they were actually traveling out the community. And at that point in time, Um, We just couldn't believe that there were people going hungry in our community and we were just quite shocked by the whole thing and just thought, wow, that's not right. That is not right in somewhere as rich as Surrey. And so we set up the food bank and this year we have been going nine years. And today I want to share with you a story uh, about a client that we've been working with for a number of years now um, and just how um, so difficult people's lives are that get caught in poverty. It's not one thing. It's a complex situation. It's not like you wake up one day, as one client said to me, and says, hey, today I'm going to live in poverty. You get caught in it by so many things that go on. And so this lady, I'll call her Lucy, um, which is obviously not her real name, but basically she'd been coming to us because she'd been struggling. She's got three kids. Uh, one of them is now 18. Um, and it, her life is just hard. She ended up breaking up with her partner, um, but she found it really difficult because the partners, the ex-partners, family lived in the community around her. So she struggled with that. And that initially was emotionally very draining. So we supported her. Um, we offer counselling alongside our food bank. So she started the food and then she also engaged in our counselling service to begin to rebuild some of her confidence in her life. But what we found out as we learned as it went on is that Lucy was profoundly as deaf. So therefore, um, she can't always communicate the way we always expect it. And this has caused her issues as she's going along. She gets benefits from that and she is on universal credit. But the trouble is, universal credit is a complicated system. And if you're have all your faculties at one level it's hard enough to engage it but if you're deaf it's virtually impossible to communicate so when it goes wrong she has to go through what they have a text phone system a message but what happens is so many times this text phone system just doesn't work so recently she actually put something on her journal your text phone system is not working please how do i contact you and the message came back says use the text phone system and that is kind of a, a symptom of the whole system that actually they don't seem to compare what bit is working to whatever so we spent quite a lot of time with her uh, making phone calls acting on behalf trying to connect all these bits up 
and working with her to gradually rebuild her life. Um, one of her uh, utility bills, she was massively in debt, so we supported her to raise some funds to basically help her on that side. And that's really important because we find that we talk about choice and too often even some of the people on the media talk about the choice you make between buying this or buying that. But the reality is it's not the choice that we think of. Most of these people, their choices is between do I put my cooker on to cook my food? Do I keep my fridge on to keep my insulin cold? Or do I basically um, use my food money to buy food? So it's not a choice of actually tonight, oh, am I going to have a Chinese or am I going to have a curry? It's a different world. And until you get into it and begin to understand, it actually is really complex and really difficult. And obviously, we're part of Trussell. Trussell, the biggest network of food banks in the country. And Trussell's agenda is about saying, actually, it's not right that we have food banks. It's not right that our country, bulk of our country is fed on food banks. In COVID, um, they were over 130% up. Actually, locally, we were 236% up of the amount of people we fed in 2020 compared to 2019. It's horrific. And that's in Surrey, a rich community. The question I'll leave you with is, what do you do that keeps somebody in poverty? And the little illustration I always use is that actually, do you have a, somebody comes and cleans your windows and they put a card through the door? Do you pay that straight away or do you actually wait a week? They've done the work, small businesses. Cash flow is the king that kills it. We have had so many people come to us that run small businesses where the business has just fallen over and we've ended up having to support them. So what do you do that keeps somebody in poverty? And what can you do that can help somebody out of poverty, whether that's challenging a policy government-wise or actually in your community, what goes on that increase costs for people living in our society? It's not right that anybody should be using a food bank. Stories about resources can often hide the systemic oppression that benefits from the very situation generosity tries to alleviate. Our reading today is the one from the Gospels about the widow's might, where a poor widow puts in a coin. I've never been convinced that the interpretation of this reading is about her generosity. I think the story is an expose about how the burdened are further burdened, while those who could make change just watch on. Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she, of her penury, hath cast in all the living that she had. God of complication. Onlookers observed a situation where a widow with little felt manipulated into giving all she had, while they themselves were continuing a system of complicity. We are populations of people who say we wish to do good, even though we feel we have very little. Sometimes this is true, for when we have little, God of ecosystems, help us know how to cheer on a system of generosity. For when we have much, even when we deny it, help us know how to give towards what can make a true difference. For times when we're part of a system of oppression, one manipulating people with little to give all, one maintaining a system of racism, misogyny, homo or transphobia and environmental degradation, help us find the words and actions to repent. If our changed lives are all we have to give each other and give you, then let us give our changed lives to each other in joyful and creative turning to justice, not afraid to confess, not afraid to embrace the change that's a mark of a better and more equitable system of belonging. When you said subdue the earth, you didn't mean each other. For those of us who carry sins of racism in our bodies, We confess the sins of empire, the sins of Europe, the sins of horrors against humanity, sins of ours. What began centuries ago continues its effect today. In playgrounds and borders and policies and discrimination, we confess this sin as the rot that it is and carry responsibility for repentance. May we repent. May we honour equality with truth-telling and change. 
This is our prayer. We make our prayer in the name of repentance. This year, the eyes of millions of watchers were on Kenmure Street in Glasgow, where a crowd of people surrounded a van that was readying to remove two men from that street under immigration laws. People sang, held a festival atmosphere and a place of resistance. I spoke to Selena Hales, who is the founder of Refuigi, about their work in Glasgow, the network they've created and the work she feels is before us all. So the way that I describe what we do now is we give the existing community a way to welcome and embrace the arriving community. It's all about connecting and bringing people together however we can. Lovely. And letters as well, isn't that right? Are there ways that you get folks to write letters? Yeah, so it was really important to me when Refugee started that we weren't a charity that was always asking people for money or for items. That for people who didn't have um, very much, they were also given a way to pass on their welcome, to say to somebody that they were happy, that they were safe. Um, So we came up with the idea of letters for the locals. And that's a letter from anybody at all. I get lots of questions on social media all the time about, can I write one if I'm not from Glasgow? Um, You can write, you're a local wherever you are. Um, You can write them from anywhere. And we now receive them from all over the world. But just passing on a message of kindness. And they can be really, really short. Some of them, one of my favourite short ones just says, you're him new, help yourself to biscuits. <laughs> Could you say a little bit about what happened on Kenmuir Street on the 13th of May? I know that Refugee and the network there was really involved in bringing along a critical mass of people when a forced removal was about to happen. We first got a heads up. We always look out for no evictions um, who post when there are immigration vans in the areas and they always sort of go straight to socials and we got an alert from them saying um, something's happening down on Kenmuir Street. Let people know. So we instantly put out on our social media, go down, be polite, bear witness, be present, listen, share, just be um, mm. and boy did the community respond and did they deliver um, we were actually really busy that day doing deliveries so I was out in the van delivering a pram and a um, baby changing unit to a recently arrived mum you're not going to get those Glaswegians to move you've not a chance 
No. You've, you've no way of shifting it. This chant of they're our neighbours, let them go, this very natural, just, there was no aggression in it. It was just this very loud, clear, these are our neighbours, let them go. And that just, I think it'll be ringing in the ears of Glaswegians for a very, very long time. And it didn't just send a message to the two men in that van. It sent a message to every individual and family in this city who is awaiting their claim. So many of our friends and volunteers came in the next day saying how much safer they felt as a result of witnessing that. So what are some of the systemic ways within which folks who'd want to get involved and who'd want to support can be aware in their own local communities? What would you tell folks to look out for? And what would you tell folks in terms of being aware? I think the biggest thing that people need to be looking at at the moment is the new immigration bill that unfortunately is now past two stages of its approval um, in Parliament. And it is utterly barbaric. It is horrifying the contents of this new immigration bill that Pretty Patel wants to pass. So please take time to go and look at what that contains. Um, I can't even go into a lot of the horror of it, but the most important things to yeah. me are offshore detention spaces and um, processing centres. Um, being held offshore, um, that we won't take many Afghan um, arrivals because it may encourage more. Now, I'm sure it has not missed anybody what is currently happening in Afghanistan, but the fact that our government continues to prioritise British citizens and continues to focus our attention solely on British and American citizens is horrific. It's a failure to meet our agreement of the Refugee Convention. It is a failure to recognise what refugees are. And throughout this entire bill, that's what they are trying to do, is to blur the lines between refugee and migrant. We are not talking about people who are choosing to leave. We are talking about people who have been forced. And a lot of that force is on our hands as well, our government's hands. And I know that a lot of people say it's not my government, but it is our government. And we need to stand really, really firmly against that. It's on the back of Kemmuir Street. People really, really do make a difference in it. So use your people. <laughs> being in the open with each other, being together, sharing food, conversations, unexpected catch-ups, unforgettable performances, joyful reunions. God, we find you in the bond between strangers and friends. We pray for everyone who is feeling the effect of distance and isolation this year. It has been difficult May we find courage to continue to connect via Zoom, via text, via walks, via letters and phone calls. This is our prayer. We make our prayer in the name of friendship. Just get 
Restrictions are lifted and furlough schemes begin to act. We face new waves of redundancies and unemployment. God, we pray for everyone whose job is under threat and everyone whose budgets are stretched thin. In businesses, in families, in households. We celebrate food banks and charities, but dare to ask for a society where food banks and charities are less needed. Inspire leaders, God of the ground, let us have policies that support the people. This is our prayer. We make our prayer in the name of justice. We want to give you a chance for conversation and response and reflection. We have two ways for that. Firstly, I'll mention our Greenbelt appeal this year. Details about that are coming up. But before we get to that, plenty of you are in groups. Turn off your devices. Look to each other. And if you're by yourself, take a moment of reflection. What moves you in what you've heard? And what are you moved to do? Why not press pause on whatever device you're listening to this on? Take a few minutes and then press play when you're ready to rejoin us. Welcome back from your reflection. Whether taking time with each other or yourself, we're so glad to be with you. We're together, but not together. We're in a spirit with each other, but we hope we can be with each other in body soon. Here's some news about how you can contribute to this year's Greenbelt Fund. This year, your generous giving will be split 50-50 once again. 50% will go towards the vital work that our partners Christian Aid and Trussell Trust do to challenge, advocate, develop and aid globally and domestically. And 50% will stay with Greenbelt as we work to make sure the festival remains sustainable in these most challenging of times. And so we can be back in the fields at Bowton House for a fully fledged festival in 2022 and beyond. So please go to greenbelt.org.uk forward slash give to make your donation. That's greenbelt.org dot uk forward slash give to make that donation and last year despite not being together you gave an incredible thirty three thousand pounds so let's see this year if we can top that generosity thank you as we end a blessing it is the job of festivals to remind us who we can be with one another 
to remind us of the joy of art, of sharing, of conversation and interruption, music, food, justice and hope. Even though we don't have a festival this year, we bless each other as if we have. We bless each other with the hope of a greater justice, with the hope of a society of integrity, with the hope of repentance, acknowledgement, shared homelands, lives and livelihoods, joy and art and celebration and safety. In this hope we hope, in the names of God, we turn to each other for a festival of joy, a festival of safety, a festival of life. Amen. So many people contributed to this year's Greenbelt podcast in place of our Sunday service. We put their names and links to all of their organisations in the show notes of the podcast. Thanks for being with us.